Uh, I'd like to welcome Nathan Price to stage, please. Thank you. Nathan is a professor and director at the Institute of uh, System, uh, Systems Biology, and he's also the co-founder of Arivo. Okay, please take it away. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you, Lee. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure to be here. I uh, look forward to uh, hopefully having some interactions with people uh, this morning. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, what we've been building uh, at the Institute for Systems Biology and across a number of different uh, institutes and uh, and the company that we spun out. So as was mentioned, so I am a co-founder of a company called Aravail. <clears throat> I'm also on the scientific advisory board for another company called uh, Habit, which is a new personalized medicine company. So just in terms of my uh, disclosures and so forth. So uh, if you look at healthcare costs, about 86% of total healthcare spend uh, is uh, around chronic uh, disease. Uh, and that's estimated by the CDC. And so if you look then at the determinants of health in the United States, it uh, turns out, and this is from a 2007 New England Journal of Medicine paper, uh, you can attribute about 30% of a person's lifetime health outcome back to their genetics. About 60% of someone's lifetime health uh, refers back to uh, behavior and environment, so choices, things that are very modifiable. And only about 10% of a person's lifetime health uh, can be attributed back to the healthcare system itself. Now that's really important, and it's obviously a big uh, function of what we're talking about here today, where we want to focus more on that 90% uh, that's not as uh, focused on. So if we look at uh, the healthcare industry, uh, we spend just under $4 trillion a year on healthcare, and according to a National Academy of Medicine report, 97% of those costs are spent on care after illness. Uh, and we saw a great uh, graphic from uh, our previous speaker where we saw that huge differential in the trajectory of the United States in terms of life expectancy versus healthcare spend and the rest of the world. And a lot of that, I think, can be attributable back to this focus on care after disease and uh, not as much on some of the healthy lifestyles uh, that are more indicative or more common in some of those other countries that you saw. So we have the healthcare industry. We also have uh, a wellness industry, and a number of us are participants in that. Uh, the wellness industry, though, we would uh, argue, and I, I think is pretty clear, has had a mixed reputation. There are a lot of really great things that happen in that industry, and there's a lot that isn't uh, uh, based on uh, good science and doesn't have a lot of good evidence uh, behind it. And so what we see is the rise of a new industry uh, that we call scientific wellness. So this is uh, sort of our word for I guess the hyper well-being concept that we're talking about at this meeting. And so in scientific wellness, the idea is to be very much more proactive about optimizing health uh, in advance, uh, as well as developing approaches uh, so that we can, um, over time, uh, minimize uh, chances of disease. And so on the, on the medicine side, or the disease side, um, we talk a lot about a concept called P4 medicine. Uh, and so in the founding of Aravel, and I meant to mention this at the beginning, uh, the other co-founders are Clayton Lewis, who's our CEO, and Lee Hood, uh, who is, uh, for anyone who's uh, aware, uh, really a legend in biotech. And so Lee has uh, been pushing a concept for many years that he calls P4 medicine. That's a medicine that's predictive, that's preventive, that's personalized, and that is participatory. And the first three, I think, are pretty self-evident. Participatory means uh, enabling individuals through knowledge uh, to be able to make uh, choices uh, that can uh, affect greatly their future health trajectories. And so we break this down into two sides, uh, wellness quantified as well as disease uh, demystified. And so this is what we see as being the rise of a new industry that we call the scientific wellness industry that I would say encompasses a lot of what we're talking about here and all the great companies that are represented here, as well as uh, the disease industry, which is really what the current healthcare industry is uh, by and large. So to take that from concept, uh, Lee and I, uh, a few years ago, uh, were talking a lot about and visiting lots of healthcare systems and chat, talking about P4 medicine and trying to get traction around this idea. And I'd say it led to a lot of great meetings, some wonderful dinners, and sort of not a, uh, not a lot else for a while. And so uh, what, what we wanted to do was to think about what, what could change the trajectory uh, in a way 
uh, where we could really bring this to life. And so what we did into, uh, is to propose uh, a couple of years ago uh, what we called the 100K Wellness Project. So this was uh, a vision we put out in a number of publications, uh, basically to recruit 100,000 individuals, uh, do whole genome sequencing on everybody, and then multiple times per year gather proteomes, microbiomes, metabolomes, wearable devices, and so forth with uh, a very audacious goal, which was to build a database that would have the depth to it so that we would have enough kinds of measurements uh, and the dynamic elements that we were following over enough time so that we could identify the early warning signs for the, uh, the major human diseases so we could develop approaches to predict them and prevent them. Uh, and so this was a uh, visionary uh, piece. Uh, if you know Lee, he's a very uh, a bold, uh, bold thinker and, and, uh, and risk taker. And so we set out uh, to, uh, to do this so that we could, uh, we hoped, have a material impact on, um, on health care uh, and wellness care uh, in, this, uh, in the world. So the shape that this has ended up taking is basically along two different uh, but integrated directions. So one is that we uh, co-founded a company uh, called Aravale, and you'll hear a lot more about Aravale it, itself and its mission specifically uh, from me and Nice, uh, who will speak tomorrow. But briefly, uh, Aravale is a company we started it about 15 months ago. Uh, we now have about 120 employees. Uh, we've, uh, we now have, uh, we've taken about 1,500 people through uh, the, uh, this program with a, uh, about 3,000 more individuals uh, who are signed up. So we've got about uh, 5,000 people uh, who are uh, uh, working with us now at various stages. Uh, and what, we, what we're looking to do uh, with Aravale is this is a, uh, a commercial entity but it is driving uh, scientific wellness, so it has a program for individuals to come in, they get paired with a health coach, and basically what they get is a chance to have highly data-informed recommendations back to them. And then what we hope is that for individuals who will come through, if they check a box saying that their data can be used anonymously for research, and thus far uh, over 90% of them have done so, and we're so grateful for that, if they check that box saying that their data can be used anonymously for research, that, uh, that data then comes back into ISB, the nonprofit uh, where I work, uh, and we can study it and mine it to try to develop the healthcare of the future and to identify early warning signs for disease and a whole host of other things that I'll talk about in the remainder of this talk. On the other side uh, of where this vision is being implemented is via uh, Institute for Systems Biology, the nonprofit where I work, that has now recently been, um, is now affiliated with Providence Health and Services. So we're now a part of Providence, and they are uh, the third largest healthcare system in the country. So this is 50 hospitals seven uh, in seven states, and Lee Hood has just become their chief science officer for the whole system. So basically what we've got then is uh, we have buy-in from the top leadership, uh, we have reach out in all the clinical groups, and so we have uh, this huge a clinical platform uh, in order to drive change in, uh, in the healthcare system. And so what this is letting us do then is to focus on particular populations uh, and particular areas where we want to drive this approach. And so this leads us to do things like uh, clinical trials around uh, Alzheimer's. So we're going to be rolling out uh, a very large uh, Alzheimer's um, uh, prevention program. Uh, we have a I won't talk about it a lot today. We have a lot of evidence behind this that we're really excited about. We'll have a big um, clinical trial to test it. Uh, we've got programs around diabetes, diabetes prevention and uh, treatment and reversal, uh, and uh, a number of, of others that I won't go into uh, uh, in the, in the um, interest of time. And so basically that gives us our two approaches, Aravel, which is completely a, a wellness-focused company, as well as ISB Providence, which gives us a clinical arm. And so we've got a lot in place, and so we actually believe now that we're going to be able to scale this much, much larger than that original 100K uh, vision that we had. Okay, so to start that all off and really make it uh, more, um, you know, and start with a very tractable, uh, bite-sized um, um, challenge, uh, we launched in, two, uh, in 2014 a project that we called the Pioneer 100. And this was basically to take 100 individuals, uh, and prototype uh, this approach to scientific wellness um, and P4 medicine. 
uh, and Lee Hood and I uh, were the uh, principal investigators on that uh, project. And so in essence, uh, so we started, uh, it ended up being 108 pioneers because uh, we had a lot of individuals who kept wanting to join, people that we really, really wanted to have in the, in the study. And so, they, uh, so we kept ticking it up a little bit, but we had 108 uh, pioneers. Uh, they range in age from 20s up to 88 plus, and I say it in that weird way because the uh, IRB doesn't let you give anyone's age above 88, uh, so that's how that is. Uh, the nine month, it was a nine month study, uh, it was um, IRB approved as I mentioned, and essentially it was a study to evaluate um, this uh, concept. And so what did we actually do? So we measured for everybody whole genome sequencing, uh, we did detailed blood, urine, saliva measurements. I'll talk a little bit more about those on the next slide. Uh, we did gut microbiomes uh, three times per year. Uh, we did continual self-tracking, Fitbits, things like that. Uh, did a lot of data integration, uh, looking at new relationships. I'll talk to you about some of the findings on that in just a moment. Uh, and then we also did monthly coaching sessions, and so this was really a key piece. So it wasn't just the data coming in. And this is really important to the whole system working which is that the data as it comes in needs to be filtered back to individuals by coaches to identify actionable possibilities. It has to make a real difference in their life today uh, because if it doesn't really make a difference to them, if it's not meaningful, uh, then there's not that pull to stay with us over the long run uh, to have the big impacts that we think we can have uh, over the course of life. Okay, so um, in terms of the assays and the measurements then, uh, so as I mentioned, we did whole genome sequencing. This leads to millions of differences between any individuals in terms of uh, different kinds of variants that exist uh, in your genome. Uh, labs, so we do about 150 clinical chemistries between 700 and 1,000 uh, metabolites, uh, depending on how many hits we get for any particular person, uh, about 400 proteins. Uh, gut microbiome, as I mentioned, three times per year. Uh, for the moment, that's uh, 16S uh, ribosomal sequencing and we do self-tracking um, Fitbits and things like that to uh, monitor sleep, uh, activity levels, and so forth. And essentially what this does then is this allows us to build a database. We call these uh, dense dynamic personal data clouds uh, around every uh, particular individual. And so I'll refer back to that, but that's essentially what we're talking about. So a pretty broad range of information um, over time, dense in the sense that there's a lot of different measurements, dynamic in that we have multiple measurements over time, and personal because all the data is about you as an individual. So uh, in that study, we had uh, just a fantastic uh, wellness coach, Sandy Kaplan. She's now the director of coaching over at Aravale. Uh, she was, I'll say, uh, by far the most popular person in the study. I think all the pioneers uh, basically love Sandy. Uh, me included, and uh, was just uh, fantastic to work with her. We also had a physician, so anyone's data that comes in, if there are things that are medically actionable, so it's reviewed, uh, in this case, by a physician at Craig Keebler, uh, and then if it was medically actionable, we would refer it back into the healthcare system, right, because this wasn't a healthcare play. This gets back to, to the system, and then it gets uh, dealt with appropriately. So let me just talk very briefly about a few outcomes. One of the things that, uh, that jumped up immediately, and Lee actually referred to this um, earlier, is that uh, when we first started, one of my, you know, one of the things I really wanted to see and maybe one of my worries was, what if we get all this information and it, there isn't much to tell back to individuals, right? That was partly what we were prototyping in the first hundred. And, uh, and what was really amazing is as we went through it, it turned out that absolutely everybody had something that was happening in their body that they could do something about that would have a positive impact on their health downstream. Um, and so if we look at some of the clinical labs, and this is, uh, these are just using one type of data, just the clinical labs. But as we looked at that, by going through a program that helped people make behavior modification, and that's what really the coach's uh, primary expertise is, uh, along with understanding the information, uh, we were able to see for cardiovascular markers that change quite slowly. This is over a period of six months. Uh, by, uh, so our first blood draw is at the three-month mark, last blood draw at the nine months, so that difference. This is, these are six-month changes. So a 6% improvement in the number of people who are out of range on various cardiovascular markers, and those are just determined by uh, standard uh, clinical um, um, uh, definitions. Diabetes, we were able to improve by um, 33% for diabetic markers. These are many people who are pre-diabetic. I'll talk more about that in detail on the next slide. Inflammation by 12% and nutrition by 21%. 
So on diabetes in particular, or prediabetes, we had seven individuals uh, who were classified by the healthcare system as prediabetic uh, that we were able to normalize over the course of that uh, six months. Uh, if you base that on uh, standard clinical measures, hemoglobin A1C, fasting glucose, uh, we saw improvements between 19 and 38 uh, percent. And if you look at insulin resistance in particular, which is a precursor, that we were able to have an improvement on of over 50 percent. Uh, and so there, uh, this was just showing the impact of behavior and lifestyle uh, on a number of these uh, factors. Okay. So a second one, and we have tons of these, I won't go into them too much in the interest of time, but another one that was quite interesting is we had one of the participants came in and he was having a cartilage breakdown in his body and he developed arthritis or arthritic-like symptoms uh, in his knees. And he was really worried about this and he'd been, uh, he had concierge medicine on both coasts and his doctors had given him, um, you know, drugs for arthritis but didn't seem to really be helping. And so uh, he came into our study uh, and we took this very broad 360 degree view and a couple really, a couple things just popped out very obviously. One was that the ferritin levels in his blood were sky high. Uh, no one had ever measured them before. That just means he had a lot of lead in his blood. So because of that, we then looked in his genome, we scanned, we saw that he was homozygous for the genes, I mean, he has two copies of the gene uh, that encodes, uh, that is associated with a disease known as hemochromatosis. Okay. So hemochromatosis' main line is it leads to liver uh, failure and death, ultimately. You can die from hemochromatosis. But one of the side uh, effects that it can have in some people is that it can catalyze this type of cartilage breakdown, and it can lead to arthritis or arthritic-like symptoms. And so when you look at that, uh, what that meant is that uh, he then figured out that was the issue. So he went back to the healthcare system. They diagnosed him with hemochromatosis, and he got the treatment. Now, the treatment for hemochromatosis is dead simple. You donate blood once a month. And so what he was able to do was, because he had knowledge, he could make a very simple decision, I will donate blood once a month, and that eliminated from his future a disease trajectory. So it's the kind of thing that if you don't have the information and you're just going down the path, it can cause massive problems. You find it out, you avoid disease. So that was... Um, uh, one uh, very simple case. A second case, and I'll just mention this um, briefly, uh, and this is, by the way, the data here. So if you look, so the green bar there says how much ferritin level, uh, you know, what the ferritin level is in people that have zero copies of this genetic variant, all fine. Uh, you see then in the second bar in orange, the average of people that have one copy of the variant, and then way on the right, you see the people that have two copies. Now, keep in mind this is a small sample size, so we only have two people that, that have these variants. Um, this, uh, after we were able to do the treatment with, um, uh, through the healthcare system of donating blood once a month, that totally normalized, that's what you see there. That was over the course of just three months. And the other point I wanna make out is it says there's two people, and I told you the story of one. The second is a woman, and she's premenopause. And so, for obvious reasons, premenopause, you wouldn't expect this to manifest, but now she has information. It just tells her, by the way, you have two copies of this gene. Uh, it means that you might, you know, might, might not, but you could manifest hemochromatosis later in your life. As long as you're monitoring your ferritin levels, if you ever see them go up, just get into a practice of donating blood regularly, and you will eliminate that disease trajectory. Knowledge, map, uh, and you can make decisions for your future. Okay. So now I just want to tell you a little bit about what we're learning uh, from the data in the last uh, five minutes or so that we've got. So here's just a big correlation diagram. But what I want you to just contemplate is this is showing relationships only across data types. So between the clinical data and the microbiome, between the microbiome and the metabolites and so forth. But the brief thing I want you to think about is just all of these measures from the same group of individuals never been done before. And so what that means is that we're looking at the tip of a very big iceberg, and humanity is about to cross from ignorance into knowledge on many, many fronts because we have never actually measured our bodies as an integrated system in much detail before. And that's what so many of us in this room are trying to change. So we can then take this, um, these correlations, and in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through the details of the algorithm, but basically in an unbiased way, you can, you can cut this into... Uh, different bits, 
where the, uh, that are much more uh, connected to each other than they are to the rest of the network. And so this gives you a set of communities to analyze and you can identify pieces that you already know how to interpret and it tells you about the other players that seem to be as, as uh, the most connected to those. So just to give one example, so here's a uh, total cholesterol community. And so if we dive in here, we can see here are all the molecules that are most related to cholesterol. Uh, a couple that pop out here. Uh, cholesterol is very positively associated with vitamin E. Uh, so there's a relationship between that across all the individuals. Uh, here's a in very interesting one, I think. Cholesterol is negatively associated with uh, thyroxine and you know, endogenous thyroxine, means thy thyroxine in the body. And the reason that's interesting is that there's actually a drug uh, from uh, thyroxine called Synthroid. And one of the side effects of Synthroid is that it lowers cholesterol. And so that, and we've actually found a whole bunch of these that pop out of the analysis where you see uh, either a, a drug that's, in, that's uh, in clinical use or that's been recently approved or a, or a close chemical derivative of where you can identify that they have relationships, they move jointly with the things that end up being their targets. And so there's a bunch of those that are known there's a whole bunch of those that aren't known. And so what does that mean? That means that we can mine those to look for um, different uh, potential intervention strategies around all these clinical markers because we know what the levers are in the body. It's a very interesting path for drug discovery because you're talking about a molecule that's already in the, um, it's already in the body. So we know within certain concentration levels it's safe, right? Doesn't mean it's safe if you, you know, if you bump it way up or anything but you have a starting point like that, and you know that there are these relationships in the body, so very uh, interesting. Uh, this is the largest uh, community. Uh, in the interest of time, I won't go through this uh, in much detail, but essentially this is the most integrated, uh, most densely connected piece of uh, molecular data that comes out of, uh, out of a person's blood, and what you'll notice in there, uh, if you could uh, see them, we tried to bold a number, is that a lot of the clinical measurements that we use and that we focus on uh, a lot in the healthcare system are found in there. Uh, not surprisingly, I think you know, their part of this uh, center is probably in part why uh, they were discovered uh, and used uh, for clinical reach. So in the last minute and a half I have, I just want to say one more uh, thing, which I shouldn't have put at the end because I think it's in some ways the most interesting. So here uh, we have these small networks, and in essence, uh, what we're able to do now is to look at risk for disease and how it manifests in the body, okay? And so I'm gonna tell you a story about one of these, uh, and if you see, I don't, know if you can, whoop, I don't know if I can point down there or not. Uh, anyway, you'll see a connection between a molecule cysteine, and it's the only molecule that's connected to something called inflammatory bowel disease. Now remember, this is a well population, so there aren't anyone, no one in the study has inflammatory bowel disease, but everybody has a genetic risk. And what we are identifying is that we can in fact build genetic risk profiles. Uh, we can do this for about 60 different diseases now, uh, shown here. And what this means is that you can now use that risk for the disease as its own phenotype. And so then what we do is we mine the dense dynamic data clouds to identify what is correlated with that genetic risk. And that does two really important things. Um, and this is uh, just showing the details around one of these, which is cysteine. So it turns out that if you look at people that have inflammatory bowel disease, that the higher risk you are for inflammatory bowel disease, the lower the amount of cysteine in the blood on average. And so when we dive into the literature, it turns out that when people have looked at ulcerative colitis and its severity, it turns out you see the same correlation. In other words, it goes down. The lower your uh, cysteine, the, the, uh, um, the worse the disease on average. Uh, and that's that second plot. And people have also done biomarker studies. And one of the top biomarkers that comes out in blood of case controls is, again, cysteine. Uh, so just to be very brief, there are two things that come out of that. One is that you can develop um, a correction factor for almost any case control study in the world because you can correct for differences that are pre-existing as a function of the risk for the disease instead of being uh, related to the manifestation of that disease. The second and more exciting thing I would say is that you can actually identify hypotheses for how you can intervene to change someone from being at high genetic risk for a disease to being at low genetic risk for disease. In this case, uh, through a pretty simple nutritional uh, intervention. Uh, so that's a hypothesis we're going forward and test. 
And with that, I will end and um, take any questions. Thanks. Okay, Nathan. So, should we ask the time for questions? So, thank you very much.